good start. Uh, welcome to the March Weber to see monthly virtual interim. As usual, we abide by the IPR policy, and only people and companies listed there are able to make substantive contributions. So uh, looks like we'll have a pretty full agenda today. Uh, we'll discuss testing and suitable streams of various flavors, relationships between API, get viewport media, and then UN has some things on data channel on workers, transferring MSTs and so forth. Uh, so the slides are published on the wiki or the pointers to them are. Um, do we have a scribe? Can we prevail upon, I saw Henrik. Can we uh, prevail? <laughs> uh, would it be possible for someone else to do it? I, I'm trying to grab a snack. Okay. Now, Amr, someone else, can, can we get a volunteer? It, it doesn't have to be complicated, just write down the conclusions. I'm not hearing. I'm not hearing anybody <laughs> jump. I can. I can do it. Okay. Thank. Thank you. You win. We probably. All right. Uh, and and we have the IRC channel. Okay. So here's what's on the agenda. We pretty much talked about it. Uh, we're going to start off with a little discussion of uh, testing. So Harold. Yes. Yeah, at that line. Oops, <laughs> I had forgotten that. I had forgotten that I was presenting that one. Uh, I can do it if you if you like. Uh, it's it's not very complicated. Basically, we're recapping what we said at the last meeting, which is to try to find a proposal that would be simple enough to implement, but still catch more bugs than we're finding. So the resolution from last meeting was to build a content reflector that speaks to Weber to see stack, but as minimum as possible, just echo back what it gets over WebSockets. So uh, Jeremy Lane and Fippo built a demo. Uh, it was only 60 lines of code, and it pretty much seemed to do what we needed to do. It used, was based on the AIO quick, sorry, AIO RTC Python library. Um, and it parsed RTP, RTCP, SCTP, et cetera. Uh, there are three tests that have been written, I think, since the last meeting. One was, uh, caught some Mac issues. There was one that was focused on RTCB, RTCB buys, making sure that buys weren't sent when they shouldn't be. Um, and then a VP8 simulcast test. So I think we have a pretty good proof of concept that this works. Um, FIPO has rewritten the server, stripped it down a little bit, used the ORTC uh, uh, API that's also in AIORTC. So it, it does less, which is actually is kind of an advantage here because you base it, it enables you to capture uh, things like stun or DTLS if we needed to do that. So basically, we have a pretty good prototype, pretty good test. And the question is, what do we need to do to actually get this into WPT? Um, and I think, as I recall, uh, there was there there's some uh, bureaucracy there, and that it it's uh, it, there hasn't been an instantaneous, you know, it doesn't seem like this isn't a particularly complicated thing. It's like 60 lines of code, but getting it hosted, I guess, is an issue. So the question, I guess, for the group is uh, bureaucratically, what do we need to do to get this 60 line server up there and hosted and uh, maintained? Um, I think we need to we need to do an RFC proposal on, on their GitHub, and then it will be discussed by the core WPT team. And if they approve it, then we would be ready to land the PR. Uh, I'm guessing that if the PR is already there, we could uh, do uh, <clears throat> the uh, RFC request and show them what the PR would be, so that they can they can have a good sense of what. Yeah, what, I what looked for the of complexity. Yeah, I looked for the PR. I didn't see it, at least under the Weber DC label. I don't know, Harold. Do you know if it was submitted? Or if it's in there somewhere? It wasn't submitted yet. Ah, okay, okay. 
so I guess uh, so we can if we can write down UN next step is I guess to submit the PR um, and then to get feedback from the WPT folks on it I guess is that the next step uh, yes and I I guess we need to file an RFC. So there's a, there's a process in WPT to actually do that kind of stuff. And I, I think it's called an RFC. So we probably need okay. to file either an issue or, uh, so I can, I can look at that after the meeting. And, uh, okay, so, thank you. So action item on your end to file the RFC and on on Philip to, to make sure that the, the pull request is submitted? Well, so I think we need to talk about that, Harold, since FIPO is with NVIDIA and they are not a member of the W3C. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, we, we, we should take that offline to see exactly who submits the PR. Um, so to, to be but, clear, uh, WPT is independent of the WCC, so you don't need to be... Oh, okay. So that's not an issue. Member, that's not so an issue for WPT. Great. It's not. It's not. Yeah, excellent. I know FIPO has, has done pull requests on uh, WPT in the past. Okay, so anyway, that's great that that's not an issue. So I guess uh, your uh, suggestion, Harold, makes sense, which is for FIPO to submit a PR, I guess. Uh, and I think, is that it, Tom? Everything we need to do? Uh, so just to reiterate what you were saying, uh, that pull requests should include or should be completed by an RFC pull request, uh, which described the reasoning uh, or the motivation for, for the change. And I, I pasted on the chat the link to the WPT RFC process. Okay. Okay, great. So I think we understand what the next steps are. Um, there is one kind of question, question which is how far we go. Um, I think the things that have been done so far seem to me like good things to do. Uh, like the NAC, the RTCP buy, it basically allows us to find a few more protocol things. I don't know that we have uh, enormous ambitions here, like to to try to rate a conformance suite for all of the RTC web stuff. That would seem probably beyond our interest or capability. Um, but it does seem to be useful to discuss what the what the scope is. I don't know, Harold. Do you have any thoughts? How how, how what kind of things make sense and what would be too much? So the so the scope scope would basically be basically be that uh, to test the links between uh, web specs and ITF specs. That is to say, if if the web spec says that uh, this and this should uh, be done according according to the ITF spec, then it should actually happen that way. Yeah, I mean, and, I, and presumably people will spend effort on tests that actually you know have been an issue. Um, so I, I don't think we're in any danger of anybody going overboard and writing too many tests. That's doesn't probably not a realistic problem. That <laughs> uh, and anyway, there's an well, example. I don't know, WPT. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say WPT can only be usefully used for things that are surfaced from uh, browser API perspective, so uh, that kind of already scopes pretty yeah. significantly what would be got done. Yeah, I, I think Harold said it well. It's basically protocol implications of stuff that's in the API, and presumably yeah. it'll be things that we actually said in the spec should happen from a protocol point of view to make sure they actually happen. Um, right, I, I would look at WebSocket there. WebSocket is a protocol defined in IETF, and it's an API defined in WFC. And uh, WebSocket WPT is testing like uh, uh, the handshakes and things like that, which are defined in the ITF, but are really relevant to any WebSocket implementation in the browser. So yeah. OK. We should follow the same kind of uh, principle. OK. Um, and there's also an example there of some other interop stuff that's been done um, that's up on the web. OK. I think that's it for the testing discussion. We have our next steps. Um, so now, Harold, Insertable Streams use case study. Yes, now we get to that. That, 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 that I remember that I had responsibility for. Uh, so, uh, as a project in uh, inside Google, 
Uh, it's not currently active, but, but it got uh, a fairly good description of what it needed in order to work. The short title was NetEQ in Wasm, which is the part that takes audio from the from the net uh, and uh, looks at it puts in extra samples if the clock is running slower, deletes samples if the clock, if the source clock is running fast compared to your own clock, and uh, and uh, makes up the stuff to cover lost packets and so on and so forth. All the stuff that you need to do clean up. And people were, the people who, who did this project was, were, trying to answer the question, can we do this in Wasm instead of depending on and on the browser behavior here? And uh, the result of the, of the study was that, yes, I th we think we can, and we think we can get the performance we need, but we need some more, some more interfaces to do it. Next slide. So this is the pipeline that uh, would uh, be desirable. We'd want to take pa packets from the RTP depacketizer, put them in encoded data buffer because buffering takes much, much less room when you do it when data is encoded. Then uh, once you need the packets, you run them through the web codec decoder and then uh, do, do all the algorithmic filtering on the raw data because uh, audio data is much, much easier to deal with when it's raw. And then play it out to the browser. All this has to happen with, uh, with uh, quite low jitter and has to happen within not, uh, not very many milliseconds. Um, so Harold, where does the WASM principally come in? It looks like the beginning of that pipeline is just this kind of the standard pipeline. Where's the WASM get inserted? So the WASM would uh, probably be in uh, the signal processing that goes out on after the raw data buffer. Ah, OK. But the but other the, stuff uh, is pretty much the usual web codecs, right? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We could do a, the codec in WASM too, but, but that, uh, that would be fun for experimental codecs. But, uh, Decoding usually takes a little time, so and the less uh, the less time we can use, the better. This depends on uh, how much overhead there is and making the package jump back and forth. <clears throat> Next slide. So I had a question on the slide, or do you take questions at the end? Yep, uh, fire fire away. Okay, uh, what is RTP depacketizer here? Is this WebRTC receiver or a web transport receiver? It's it's the part of the uh, in this case, it's the part of the WebRTC receiver that comes before the decoder. Okay, but it's it's uh, RTP and not data channels, for example. Yeah. Okay. I mean, once once we have this, like, you could theoretically feed the same pipeline from a from something else, but uh, this is the one we wanted at the moment. Yeah. Same question for browser playout. Yeah. What, what is for browser playout? So that's uh, basically get, getting it getting it to the actual speaker or headphone or wherever it, it should go. Okay, so is it like uh, hooking a MediaStream track to a video element, or is it like using audio worklet to render, or um, is it both? Or? We would want to hook it to hook it hook it straight to an to an audio element. Okay. And possi possibly by represent represented in the control surface by a media media stream track. We don't we're not sure about that yet. So getting stuff into the browser playout when we have the raw buffers, that seems to be what we create what we define the media stream track generator for. They just feed in raw buffers and get out a media stream track, which you can connect it to 
a device, so that's okay. The normal case for uh, for insertable streams is that when an incoming track is created, the browser sets up depacketizing, decoder, track, fires on track, then you can uh, call create, create breakout streams on the on the receiver, or in the new API that uh, UN is prototyping. Uh, fire an event at a relevant worker that contains the input and output streams so that you can hook into them. So, the, 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 it would be nice if we had, next slide, an API that allows us to do something like this. Create a pay connection with some extra parameters. Create an output that's connected to media stream generator. We have API for that. Create a worker that uh, where the PC and output gets connected to. And then in the worker, we, we could do create the decoder, set up the feeds. And uh, when you get the events from the event or message from, uh, from the main, main uh, uh, main from the main thread say hey start working it connects the input stream and output stream and the and the, and the decoder all inside the worker so there are a few de details missing here and some very pseudo like pseudo codish codish coded so next slide So what, what, is I, what we find is missing now is we want to create, tell the media peer connection what to do, that the peer connection does not need to do a, uh, not need to create a track, mm. does not need to, to create a decoder. Just right. give me the stream of encoder frames, I handle the rest. And of course, if we want a specific API for getting the streams to the worker, yes, we need that API. So we could do what uh, Johan is proposing with the with the, with the media stream track event and give a, give a specific API that is just for handing this part type of stream to this type of worker. Or we could uh, do the do what we did with the first version of uh, the insertable streams and say. Okay, let's just extract the streams and let uh, and send them in a message. Use existing APIs. Uh, and we'd also like guarantees that uh, once audio frames are emitted from JS, they get played out with no extra data, because the whole purpose of the of the thing is to is to create a stream of audio samples that are that sound jitter-free to the user, even if they, it wasn't jitter-free to begin with. So we want to make sure that the browser doesn't add any more, more need jitter. So far, we have not found a reason for sending, mess, sending anything back, back to the transport about what the JS modules had, had, uh, would want, because we're just assuming that the JS modules will be fast enough to keep up. And that should be it. Let me see. These guys don't belong here. So that's that's the that's the use case. Now there now there are, now there can be questions or suggestions or should we should reasons not to do this at all? So, if I understand things, um, they are, yeah, the, the diagram there is quite useful. Uh, so there's um, there's a depacketizer, and then there's a decoder, and and then you have decoded data that either go to a media stream track or it could go somewhere else. Uh, if you con control the output of the decoder, that's really what you want. You, you want to get the output from the decoder 
then send it to some audio worklet to do your own um, jitter uh, algorithm so that you can output it whenever you want and, and control things. Now we'll, that, prob that's... we'll probably yeah. do the do the strict jitter algorithm before sending it to the decoder, assuming that the, uh, assuming that the, that that the decoder is uh, not introducing jitter. Oh, so, so the wasm would be before the web codec decoder, then. Is that correct? Well, there, there will be code there. Which language is it? Is it in in this? I don't I don't care much. But uh, so, so, since the buffers are so much smaller, if you want to keep a buffer of 150 milliseconds, it's easier to do them in 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 the encoded form, provided that you can get them through the decoder and through the signal processing afterwards. As I said, signal processing after decode, uh, queue management before the decode. Okay. If I so if I would break down in some requirements, uh, it seems that you want to inject JavaScript uh, after the depacketizer and before the decoder. So that could be done in WebRTC and could it transform somehow. You also want maybe to inject JavaScript after the decoder, uh, which currently is only feasible once you pipe the media stream track to audio, to web audio, and then you get the data from audio worklet. And yeah, it's, it's also possible using the, 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 media, the media transform, which is yeah, what, and, what and, and, so, and so it seems that you, so th there's these two things. You inject JavaScript before the decoder, and we already have that. You want to uh, inject JavaScript after the decoder, we may or may not have that because we have that after the media stream track for your worklet, and maybe you want it sooner. And you also want to disable uh, all the algorithms that are done by the RTCP receiver as well, which is an API that we do not surface right now. Is that a fair summary? I didn't quite uh, get the last question, last uh, sentence. So let's say that we have an API where we can plug a, a decoder. Um, we might still have some algorithms in the RTP receiver that will that will do the jitter buffering and, and so on. And since you want to do that, it seems that you want an API to disable those kind of processing so that you can do that at one of the GS injection injection points. Yeah, the whole pur the whole purpose of it is to is to bypass the jitter buffer algorithms that are currently there, which operate as I have described, but they operate at the browser level. They are they are the same for all users. Okay, so from from this, this use case, it seems to me that you you want uh, like to be able to either inject a decoder. Uh, you might want to inject JavaScript after the decoder, and you might want an API to uh, disable some processing done by the receiver as well. Yes. Okay. And uh, the part before the decoder and the part after the decoder need to communicate in, uh, in uh, ways that are out of, out of scope for standardization. I think there's you need to need to run in the same in the same workload in the same work. I'm I'm worried that the idea that you can decouple about the idea that you can decouple the the codec from this. Um, I'm just thinking about a specific instance. If if you um, like, if there's a packet that's late, then you might want to decide. Actually, I'm going to get um, Opus to backfill it. Or I'm not, depending on whether I'm prepared to wait a bit longer for it to show up. I mean, maybe it's an out of order packet, or maybe I send a knack and I'll get it in the end. So, depending on your application, you might have a different choice of behavior there. And you have to get quite close to the codec to make, to apply that decision. Yes. Um, I, I'm thinking specifically of like, you know, the current Net NetEQ does basically does pitch shifting. If the if it thinks that the um, the incoming audio is faster than than its its own clock, then it'll pitch shift it. 
um, which is like disastrous for music. There are other algorithms you could apply, but but I don't think that this pipeline would let you do that. I don't think it like it, it's trying to separate things that actually you want to entangle a bit more to get those effects. I I'm, haven't thought about this in enough detail to express it better, but that's my instinct. Um, I yeah, do think this yeah. stuff is doable because I've done it in, in a long time ago. I've done it in Java in an applet. So it's like it is possible to do this in a browser. It, the the part that uh, that uh, is uh, I mean what processing to play I mean the wala sound sound in uh, when you try to play music is one of the good targets and uh, what's appropriate for this working group to to consider is. What APIs sh should the browser offer so that others can do this? It's uh, so uh, exactly what is being done is out of scope for the group. We, we need to know about it because we have to have to figure out if if these APIs are a good fit for the job. So to um, try to throw some rocks at it a bit, the use case perhaps seems a bit narrow in that it's for people who uh, don't, uh, they're not happy with uh, WebRTC's NetEQ part. Uh, but this, at the same time, they're not willing to go as far as encoding their own audio. So that seems to be a narrow window between because you can already use, I guess, data channels and you can encode your own audio and then you can decode your own audio and you don't need new APIs to do that. And then you could do this, correct? Yes, that, that would lose right. interoperability with uh, people who actually want to send audio over RTP. Oh. Yes, but you do usually control both endpoints, right? Uh, well, to some degree, yes. <laughs> and, I mean, I mean, the concept of endpoint can be somewhat convoluted. We still haven't found. Right. We we still haven't done a Zoom yet, uh, right. where you leave you leave RTP behind. Right. So yeah, I'm just uh, wondering if the. I mean, it, it sounds useful narrowly, and uh, but are there enough other tools that almost do the same thing to warrant uh, adding this? Because I think. So far, I think we had almost come to uh, an understanding that insertable streams was more useful in the video realm because we already had audio worklets, for example. Um, so this, I guess, brings that back into question. Yeah, um, that, that was one yeah. of the reasons why I thought it was worthwhile uh, bringing it to the group right. because I, it's a use case that we, we should consider. Yeah. I, I, but, I also like. But does it belong in? Sorry. Good. Yeah, I also like that we we have these kind of use cases now, so that currently we are defining one point where we are injecting JavaScript, which is uh, at the encoded data buffer level, and it's good to okay. have like as many use cases as, as we have now to actually uh, make sure that the API that we are designing will be able to either evolve or to fulfill these use cases that. Maybe they're not well defined, but we, we have them in the roadmap, and we, we, we are making sure that we are future proof with the current API we are defining. And that's that's a good exercise. Yeah. Yeah. I do claim that we have two insertion points under consideration, but only one of them is formally adopted by the work group. Right. And I'm also also to look forward to other working groups like Web Transport, where you might receive data and use uh, either MSE or web codex uh, if people might have the same need there. <clears throat> and maybe this feature would be perhaps fit better with under web codex working group, for example. I'm not saying it does, but. Yeah. But, uh, I don't think the API is going in the right place if, if it goes to web codex because the, because the web codex work group is only about interfacing to the web codex. Yeah. Okay. 
So to what extent does just have presenting an API that says, hey, turn off all your processing and give me the packets and then feed them into an audio workload, to what extent does that solve the problem? Well, it doesn't, doesn't permit, uh, if it, you can live with, uh, with uh, doing the, the data buffer part on, uh, on decoder data, it works. The reason why, it, why there are three boxes and not just one box in, in, this, in this picture is because uh, we want to do the, the jitter buffer part on, on, the, on the encoder data side. I mean, the magic of jitter buffer is uh, not really about uh, how to delay things. It's how to, how to find an adequate uh, buffer size and to control rolling, rolling out in and out, uh, rolling samples in and out of that buffer. Well, continuing to be awkward, what's you basically you're talking about a memory saving, uh, but given that we're talking about 150 milliseconds of audio data, that doesn't seem like it's going to even make a dent in any modern browser. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. So it's certainly possible to prototype this uh, with the whole algorithm done after the decoder. In which case we could use um, media stream transform instead. Wouldn't you I, want to be able to do this for video as well, though, where memory footprint is bigger? Well, yes, yeah. I I think so. But uh, I promised the uh, promised the right of this this specific use case, and that was an audio use case. Something like something like it is probably interesting for audio for video too. People seem These to love things are usually pretty symmetrical, right? Um, yeah. It would seem silly to only solve the audio part and not the video part. Just, just for my understanding, would another way, way to phrase this be that uh, a lot of folks would like to do their own codecs and uh, use their own uh, algorithms, but at the same time, they really miss RTP. Is that right? And we haven't right. really exposed it. Is that uh, yes? Part of it. That's one way. That's one way to think of it, Yanivar. Yep. So one of the possibilities here would be to to start the start fragmenting the RTP receiver, so that so we have a, a depackizer feeding into an, a decoder, and you actually uh, <coughs> you actually uh, have to tell. Uh, the pay connection to to apply only this many building blocks to the Lego tower. Yeah. But what if someone wanted RTP and web transport, for example? At the same time, RTP. No, I mean <laughs> RTP over web transport. Oh, okay. So many building blocks. Yeah. Put, R put RTP packets into uh, the what's the current uh, quick datagrams. Right. Or it's actually HTTP datagrams now, but yeah, yeah, it's HTTP three datagrams over quick transport. But but just oh, just to come back to audio, I think you still. It's not enough to say that you want to handle it after it's been decoded, because there are things that you want to do that you want to influence the code, the, the codec, because like the behavior of how you do, like I said, do you ask Opus to make one up or do you, uh, do you wait and grow the jitter buffer is a really important decision and you want to have that in your hands. So I, my in my audio worklet thing, you'd have some kind of weird interface where what was coming in was encoded audio, and then you could feed it into a codec, and you'd have your fingers wrap around that codec somehow. Now I haven't kind of quite got that 
in my head correctly, but but I do think that you can't avoid the the step before the decoder and having some influence over the decoder. Good points. Just, just from an API point of view, though, uh, we're talking about pulling cables apart and plugging in different cables instead. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it's always either or. So uh, I kind of liked uh, someone, I forget who said it here. Maybe there's a switch we could just flip instead that would change what comes out of the uh, soft serve machine, so to speak. <laughs> but yeah. Uh. So the reason why there isn't a specific suggestion, and one main reason for why there isn't a specific suggestion for API here is that I don't know what a good, good API looks like yet. So suggestions are welcome. So this took the first half hour. <laughs> Should we stop here and then uh, yeah. say that? Yes, the use case has been presented. Yes. Uh, what's to come next is actually a little bit of an expansion on this, Harold. So it's I think maybe it will continue the discussion, although in a little bit different way. Yeah. OK. Uh, yeah. All right. So, um, so this next uh, topic is is quite similar in that it's uh, the idea is to tr present the relationships between a number of the APIs we've been talking about, um, and their their potential relationship and and use together. Um, and I think we've been seeing that, you know, we have. The media stream track inseritable streams. We have web codecs. We have web transport. Um, we have the WebRTC insertable streams, and potentially other things coming down the pike. Uh, you may have seen that there's now WebNN may potentially be standardized. So, just trying to um, describe what the relationship between all of these things might be, uh, and the ways we might plug in some of these Lego pieces together. So, this is a uh, a diagram of the API relationships when you're sending. So we have, uh, we acquire a media stream track somehow through the good old uh, media capture APIs. And then we're attempting to transform this into raw, a raw stream of video frames. And we do that through uh, the media stream track processor API, which is part of media stream track insertable streams. Um, and so we get these video frames. Essentially, something like WebNN would then operate on the video frames, um, do things like special effects or other machine learning stuff. Then the individual video frames go into the video encoder, and now we're into the Web Codex API, and they output an encoded video chunk. And then we are taking that encoded video chunk and attempting to send it uh, through potentially a variety of APIs. It could be Web Transport. Or it could be, um, this is kind of the other side of what Harold was talking about, where you might actually want to just have an RTP transport where you send this stuff over RTP. So taking that, uh, this is the this would go into the packetizer of RTP um, and then add over RTP. So or or conceivably even over a da over data channels, um, you could want to send it. So uh, there's a variety of transports. Um, they're um, out there that you could want to use. Web transport um, would be for the client server case. Uh, data channel or RTP would be for the peer to peer case. Um, so, on the receiving side, uh, it looks like this, which is you're getting the uh, encoded video chunk over one of these transports, RTP or the data channel or web transport. Um, uh, you're getting it as an encoded video chunk. You're then feeding it into the video decoder of Web Codex, uh, getting a raw video frame out of that. And then the media stream track generator is taking the stream of those video frames and outputting a track, uh, which you're then rendering via video tag. Does that make sense, Harold? I think, I think that's a correct 
description. Some of the things that may go here. So this is, these are the paths on the receiving side, um, how all this stuff might happen. So there are a variety of, and, and this is more like what Harold just presented, um, because now if you're talking about RTP, you're getting stuff out of the RTP uh, packetizer to create your encoded video chuck. So, um, so a couple of questions come to mind. Um, and I was just purely thinking about efficiency, but I think there are probably a bunch of use case questions that come out of this, like out of, of all the use cases that could be uh, encapsulated on these two diagrams, which are the ones we care most about. But I also had some questions about the performance of the pipelines described here, uh, particularly um, relating to copies that would occur. Um, and we just had this discussion uh, in, in web codex uh, for example, uh, can you have an encoded video chunk that's produced by Web Codex? Can that be sent by Web Transport or some of these other um, transports like uh, Data Channel or RTP without an additional copy? So typically that um, encoded video chunk would, would be residing in a GPU buffer, and you essentially want to take that and, and go and send it uh, directly from that buffer if you possibly can. It's probably not possible with no copies because you have process separation. So you just essentially can't can't take something in the in the GPU and just, you know, in networking, we would normally do that from user space just directly down into the driver. But uh, in the browser, you probably would need one copy, but hopefully not another one. And then um, on the receive side, can you write into, you basically want to write these encoded video chunks um, into a GPU buffer so Web Codex can handle it, and that would be, you know, Web Transport, RTP, or Data Channel. Can it write these encoded video chunks into the GPU buffer um, with as few copies as possible? And again, you probably need at least one copy, but hopefully um, no more than all of this. Um, so that's kind of a, a question about do the Lego pieces of the transports fit together with, with uh, including, um, do they fit together with Web Codex the way you'd want them to? Um, and so, then overall, yeah. So there's a special case where where you want the web as the WASM or or JavaScript right. actually actually wants to access the the buffers using web GPU. In which case, uh, there's no need to move them out of GPU buffers, but in fact, we would have to move them into GPU buffers if it wasn't already there. Right. So <laughs> just just to complicate matters. Uh, right, and some of these things, um, yeah, I didn't uh, get into WASM, but in some cases you might want to, for example, in the case of an audio codec, write your codec WASM um, and don't want to be copying stuff back and forth, which I think WASM does do, right? You get a copy there. Um, so um, that led to questions in my mind, you know, um, we, we don't, there's nothing in WebIDL which describes, a, denotes a buffer as a GPU buffer, right? It just is, is what it is. Um, we've had a discussion in Web Codex about, you know, can we denote something as a read-only buffer, uh, which is what it would be in the GPU. You wouldn't, you wouldn't write over it. Um, and uh, I guess the answer right now is no. Uh, does that have any implications for, um, we've already had questions about streams, for example, does any does BYOB help any of this in streams? And I think the answer to that is also no. For example, um, you know, can you describe something coming out of Web Codex as a bring your own buffer? Because essentially, Web Codex already allocated the buffer, and then would that improve the write efficiency in the in much of these streams? I think the answer to that currently is no. Although that's probably not the answer we eventually want. Um, and do we understand, in particular, in all of these operations, when copies do and do not occur? Um, even if we can't fix it, can we document it well enough so developers will understand, hey, if I do this, it's going to cause uh, you know, stuff to be transferred between a GPU and main memory or, or generate additional copies? Wouldn't um, that be platform specific? Like, um, There's so many ways to store buffers. I think, for example, in Mac OS, you can have IO surfaces that are usually pretty efficient both cpu and gpu when the other buffers you have to uh, copy them I, yes 
that is correct. And it, it's not even macOS. It's uh, Apple Silicon devices different from Intel uh, devices as well. So it's not something that I would try to expose to the web in general, actually. Uh, in terms of process separation, Enric is mentioning IO surface. So typically what happens is you have a process where you capture images for, from the camera. So you get an IO surface. And then you send the IO surface to the web process. Uh, sending the IO surface, it's, there's no memory copy. You're just sending okay. a handle to some shared memory. So right. there's no memory copy there, uh, at least. And it's the same for encoders. For encoders, take IO surface and will return you shared memory so that you can do uh, out of process codecs with uh, limited loss of efficiency, for instance. But again, as Henrik said, it's very platform specific and very implementation specific. So and I would be worried to expose anything in that area. Another example would be Chrome OS, where if you know uh, if you, you're, that you're going to touch it on CPU versus GPU, you might want to allocate this buffer in a different format to start with. Uh, so sometimes it's it's relevant to know what is this buffer going to be used uh, for in the future, so that I can you know find the best format or mapping. Right. Right. So um, I think. Um, <clears throat> One one disclaimer here, I think this this presentation mentions interfaces uh, that don't have consensus yet, like media stream track processor and generator. Um, but and uh, for Mozilla, we don't necessarily agree with those yet. And and some of these questions are part of the reason <clears throat> it's not clear yet what the overall picture will look like. At the same time, I do appreciate it's really helpful and valuable that implementations try out and see what is fast and what is not. So this is a good discussion, I think. For streams, the, I think the, the bottlenecks probably, I, I could see you could have browser objects that are video frames, for example, theoretically, that could still be streamed. But the two problems seem to be, how does JavaScript access those GPU buffers? And uh, at some point, they're going to transition to becoming bytes. And I think that's where uh, bring your own buffer might help. Uh, which means you would always have at least one copy, as far as I can tell. Does that sound right? Yeah, um, yeah. It's certainly at that point when they uh, they would uh, you would have a copy. Um, yeah, and also uh, some things uh, have been optimized just in in the last few weeks. Like for example, if you clone a video track that does generate a reference and doesn't generate a copy currently. Um, but uh, the reason I wanted to raise this is also for us to uh, think about the use cases, what we're trying to do, um, and also some of the implications of, of how these APIs work together. We've had the luxury, I think, in the web RTC working group of working on a single API that uh, was looked at by a, a single group of people. Um, and now we don't have that luxury anymore because looking at this, there's at least, at least three W3C working groups involved here. Actually, maybe uh, four, I think. <laughs> maybe more. <laughs> um, so there's there's communication between all those groups, and I don't know if there's even one person who attends all of them. I, I suspect not. Uh, maybe it's even, might even be greater than four, maybe five working groups. <laughs> it seems to me that a, a completely central part of the memory handling is uh, is uh, the row and encode the video buffers. And they, they are, at the moment, they are uh, defined by Web Codex Working Group. And right. the Web Codex Working Group seems to, be, seem to be on the same page as us when it comes to worrying about memory copies. Mm -hmm. so, so we probably have more use cases uh, than and they have, they, they are strict. We have, we have a separate set of use cases, I should put it that way. They probably have to cater for other things. Yeah. Like, yeah, YouTube. But uh, <laughs> yes, we all worry about buffers. Um, 
So I'm wondering, uh, are there any next steps that come to mind here? Uh, things that we sh should be doing going forward or thinking about? Um, one of them was, I think, uh, to continue on Har what Harold had, uh, to think through which of the use cases um, we think are, are particularly important. There's certainly many that you could have here, um, but, but maybe articulate them. So, so one integration step I think we should aim for is to make sure that the encoded uh, transform, WebRTC encoded transform uses the same uh, encoded buffer format as uh, as uh, web codec. Yeah. Just because uh, not having the exactly the same thing there with the and one thing needs to be a reference to the other, will lead to end, to endless frustration. Yeah, I think that one is. I think that one is very clear to the, all the people involved. <laughs> yep. Um. And uh, yeah, also the uh, maybe reaching out again to the there was a zero copy meeting at TPAC, wasn't there? Yeah. There folks there that can help. yeah, I was going to to react on that too. So th there was this discussion during the TPAC breakout on reducing memory copies. Uh, one of the outcome of that was the creation of uh, YCG repo, which saw some early activity but haven't seen much uh, recently. I think it might be useful to bring some of those uh, use cases and also early lessons in terms of buffer format to, to that repo to rekindle the discussion. I mean, I, I agree that coordination with the web codec uh, spec is probably key, but as we discussed then, and I think that's still true and even maybe truer now, uh, there are also intersections with web GPU, with web assembly, with web NN, um, and I'm probably skipping a, still a few more. So um, having a place where we are at least getting some visibility to these conversations, I think is uh, really useful. Okay. Yeah, I think um, Web Codex is paying a lot of attention to this, uh, but um, there, uh, because a lot of the work in Web Codex is specifically uh, oriented towards keeping things within the GPU. So I'm not that worried about web codecs being inefficient because it really can't be. Um, but the, the big question is when it passes things in and out to all the other APIs, can they use it in that form? And, and particularly, we had a discussion yesterday about um, encoded video chunks from, from web codecs. Can they be used by transports without a copy? So that's thinking of web codecs as input to something like web transport or RTP or data channel. And does that automatically force an additional copy? Um, so there are, I think there are some very specific questions um, that can be pointed at various specs uh, and uh, potentially answered. Um, anyway, OK, so we should probably move on from this. Um, Yanivar, get Viewport Media. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, uh, this uh, slide was, uh, I, I put together this slide as an update slide <clears throat> because we got, uh, got some good news last week from uh, Elad Alan that uh, from Google from Security Review, we now seem to have agreement on uh, how to protect uh, GetTab Media, which has now been uh, renamed uh, to Get Viewport Media, which seems to be the uh, front runner as far as naming goes. Um, so on the naming first, <clears throat> um, viewport seems to best capture uh, exactly what we're capturing, no pun intended. The definition on MDN there is that it refers to the part of the document you're viewing, which is currently visible in, in its window. And content outside the viewport is not visible on screen until scrolled into view. So that seems to be, there's still some open questions of whether an iframe can, would only see itself or itself and uh, its parents and other children. <clears throat> But back to the main point, which is uh, the security parts, which are, I think, um, maybe we could have some time to discuss 
today. So there seems to be an agreement on site isolation, but it's still a little clear um, whether we mean full specter isolation, which would be co-op plus co-op. Uh, <clears throat> and to, re to recap, there's an opener policy and an embedder policy, which when used together, turns the magical window.cross origin isolated Boolean to true. And that means you're fully specter protected. That means that uh, <clears throat> neither your embedded content nor your opener are from you know, foreign origins. <clears throat> so that's fully protected. But in this case, since we're only, I thought for now we'd only, we'd speculated that we might only need the, the latter. Uh, because we worry about what's embedded in the page and we want to make sure we don't capture things and that malicious sites can't include things on a page from other domains and then capture it. <clears throat> um, and I think so that's an open question for the working group. Uh, it might be simpler to to go with the with both still, even though if we think it's unnecessary just because it's easier to talk about site isolation and everyone has the same idea. <clears throat> And secondly, uh, that there needs to be some opt-in header for, for documents so that uh, documents can opt into being captured um, in iframes. And that's still to be determined. And uh, another thing, outstanding question there is, <clears throat> how would this fail? Uh, would we, uh, because the web is dynamic, so if, if uh, the page does not have, if the page contains iframes that have not opted in, or if the page itself has not opted in, um, does this uh, fail? Uh, well, it should probably fail to capture to begin with, but what if it, uh, it later navigates a frame or opens a new frame that has not opted in? At that point, we could either block the loading of such frames uh, in a more traditional co-op model, or we can allow it and kill the capture <clears throat> uh, and have it terminate with an error somehow. Um, so those are the questions. We do seem to have agreement, and just worth mentioning to the uh, to the working group that we seem to be in agreement uh, about some that resources may be on their own in this one. Uh, there's a there's a uh, mostly with site isolation. Uh, there's site isolation already provides a mechanism where uh, the the web is. Uh, does not load cross origin images by default, <clears throat> so images already have to opt in to this model to be included in the first place. But there's two ways. There's uh, You can do a co-op cross origin attribute that says, I allow this image to be embedded by other origins. But there's a separate uh, allow list where you can also give it access to uh, the, the, the bits of the image, <clears throat> which means that you can actually allow your image to be shared on other sites, but still be opaque. And uh, I think everyone's idea here is that we would still allow capture of that. So that is a, a concern. And But our rationale for not protecting those images that it would be <clears throat> too arduous to add HTML resources to every all of these images. And these uh, we're already these images are already not protected by Spectre because they would live in the same process as the uh, iframe that's including them. And we probably could never protect them 100% anyway. And so that's the update. And um, Ella, do you want to add anything? Um, I could, but uh, I'm not sure how much time is slated for this. I wouldn't want to monopolize the discussion with, you know, if you just wanted to give an update. OK, well, uh, on that case, um, I guess can we, uh, it's a premature to get the temperature of the room of which of these for the first three questions there. I, I've got one question, which I think maybe uh, so. Everything with security is a bit uh, requires a lot more time to think about. But I think that uh, maybe we could talk about the failure mode, because to me it seems right. like it is very important to make sure that it doesn't block loading. And I'll give an, uh, an example, uh, which is sure. admittedly just one example, but I think that it is a very uh, standard kind of example. Uh, suppose that you have got. Google Slides, OK? And there are multiple slides there, and most of the content is first, uh, first party. You start capturing, everything's OK. Suddenly, somebody embeds YouTube. What happens now? YouTube doesn't load. Go, uh, I think it would make more sense to break off the capture. Uh, and let's say that somebody just navigates there. So 
if you couldn't load, you wouldn't be ever, ever able to load, even before you even know if the user is interested in capturing. Most people are not screen sharing, right? Most, of, uh, most people would just be browsing through the slides. Uh, if they could not, uh, um, so I think the least destructive way of this failing is if you just break off a capture. Right, and that's a valid point. And I think the counter argument, uh, not to, you know, the difficulty is, is that there's also a counter argument that if, you, if I'm using Google Slides and I prepare a presentation for several days, which I have, I, I think the last point at which I want things to fail is during the actual live presentation. Because I think we are talking about a feature here that if successful, would be the hopefully primary target for applications like Google Slides, at least during the pandemic, where but you I, put all this effort into a presentation and then at the point of presenting, uh, you're not even aware that your audience might see something. Well, yeah, the, I've, one I've part got, is you might not, uh, the audience might see something else than what you're sharing or your capture may just fail. At that point, I've got the presentation would fail. Yes, I've got the counter counter argument and that is that uh, the application can know and warn the user, hey, by the way, you, you won't be able to present this. Uh, and that's something the application could do and that would work. Whereas if you just fail loading, it's like, but I was never gonna present, so why am I, why can I not load? Like basically, okay, so the application can no longer uh, load any third party content except for from a very short list of collaborating websites. Right, so, but, but uh, so I think we're talking about how it fails down. So when you say block loading, it might not block the entire presentation, but maybe it's just an, uh, maybe you embedded like a YouTube iframe in one of your slides, and the rest of your slide would present, but that would be left blank, for example. Yeah, but it would always. So basically, you would never be able to embed YouTube. You would never be able to embed anything except those very few things that have adopted both uh, that have adopted the new header. Right, the app would have to say basically, uh, uh, it would have to turn off this uh, this header at that point and say your presentation, unfortunately, is not shareable. Yeah. So, so um, it means you would have. We have, uh, we have a couple of bunch of slides from UN, so I think you might need the half right. an hour UN. So I, I think we should. Uh, you Maybe know, yeah yeah yeah. Um, we can. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like Does to suggest. Have any Sorry, just uh, quickly, any uh, preference for, um, and Ella, do you know if uh, the Google team wanted uh, full isolation or not? Um, I'll get back to you on that. I, I okay. think I have an answer, but I don't want to speak prematurely and make a mistake. Of course, of course. Yeah, in general, I think that we, we want to start with co-op, class co-op, and validate that we can relax the rules. That's the usual way of doing things. That makes sense. Thank you. And uh, in terms of killing capture, I would say mute or not mute, or unmute, but not kill the capture, really. But anyway, yeah. Um, so, sorry, just on the failure mode. So, Elad, you said uh, Google Slide could detect that this was going to fail, uh, but is that so? I mean, would they get access to the header information to determine that what we are won't work um so again google slides only being one example but i think it's an illustrative one so uh if you uh if, if you have slides you generally can just run through all of them see if if all of them just have th first party content then you just don't issue a warning whereas if any of them have third party content you know which third party it is it, it's no surprise for the application so the application doesn't need to guess uh, like it won't get it 100% correct uh, of the time. Like if some remote third party that used to collaborate, used to include that header, used to be okay, suddenly falls back to some kind of backup server that is misconfigured, of course, it, there would be a mistake. But generally when you embed third party things, you can just check them against, uh, you know, a list of known safe uh, sources. Um. Okay, I'm still not I'm still not entirely sure about that, but uh, we can continue on the GitHub issue, I guess. Shall we go to the next slide then? 
Okay. Um, so with uh, Yanivar, Henrik, and a few of us, we, we had some fun exchanging uh, ideas about defaults for get user media. So it's uh, an issue in media capture main. So to summarize the issue, um, when you call get user media, uh, the user agent, we, once the user granted permission, needs to select device settings uh, when starting capture. And usually, the, sp the spec is saying you should pick settings that have uh, the lowest fitness distance, and that's fine. The issue is that in many, many cases, there are a lot of setting values that have exactly the same fitness distance. And there, the specification does not provide any guideline at all. So the question uh, of this issue is, should the specification say more? Should we give guidelines? Should we say, should we add normative text or, or not? Or, or is, it, is it really an issue? Should we just say we are good and uh, we forget about that? So on the long uh, thread on GitHub, there, there were two positions. One was, yes, we should say more. It will help interrupt. And the other position was, no, uh, first, because this will make future evolutions more difficult. And second, uh, the assumption is that web pages should anyway provide the necessary constraints. So even though it's a theoretical problem, it might not be a practical problem. <clears throat> so that's my summary of uh, this issue and the current position. Uh, next slide. So what I did was to look at whether it's a real problem or not. Uh, spec is saying that constraints should be provided by web page for all important properties. So I went to a few websites like WebEx, Whereby, Jitsi, and I looked at which constraints they set for uh, get user media. They're all video co conference websites. Uh, some of them are not setting any constraint to echo cancellation. Some of them are not setting any constraint to frame rate. So in theory, a user agent could uh, select no cancellation and frame rate equal one. <clears throat> um, will that work? If a user agent is doing it, and that's fine, it, uh, currently it can do it, it will be a terrible user experience. Um, I haven't looked at whether they're using apply constraints later on. Maybe these websites are doing like get user media, then apply constraints, I, I don't know. I just did a quick check there on, uh, on uh, Mac OS Safari. But anyway, uh, since we are doing that, even applying constraint later on, it would be suboptimal, uh, as it would require recalibration of the camera, the microphone. Uh, and we know that these websites actually want echo cancellation. So the assumption that the spec took, which was to say that web pages will do the right thing and provide all the constraints that are really important to them, it, it's not followed. Web developers are not doing that. So I would say uh, from this little experiment that it's a real problem and that we should try to solve it. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, user agent heuristics are very important. Uh, if a user agent heuristic is saying echo cancellation equal off, then there will be impact on, on, on users. And of course, it will have a bigger impact on user agents with some small number of users. Like uh, if, if a big uh, user agent is, say, is saying, okay, echo cancellation is off, probably web developers will adapt. But for all the other user agents, uh, it's not really possible. So my conclusion is that the current state of the spec is not good enough and that we, we need to provide some guidance uh, and that's what I'm trying to, to look at at the next slide. So Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, what they're doing? Uh, they're doing roughly, roughly the same thing. Not in the same ways, but roughly they're saying echo cancellation is true by default. And uh, 640, 480, 30 fits is roughly the default as well. Um, I'm not saying it's good, but but what it is, and I'm thinking that if user agents start to change that, some websites might actually suffer from that. So the proposal I'm trying to make there is to uh, try to cope with the issue to, so the spec should provide some guidance so that we get good interrupt. But the spec at the same time should not limit future evolutions. 
So I'm trying to uh, put a proposal there so that we have both things. So the first thing to note is that we have uh, properties that have OS default values, like sample rate, sample size, they have uh, usually OS default values. So in that case, we should just use them. Just like by default, we are saying, if you do not know what device to pick, pick the default one. And the default one is usually defined by the user, by the OS. So we should acknowledge that and add in the spec, hey, if you have an OS default value, please use it if you're not sure. Um, for properties without OS defaults, I think that even though we might not want to be provide mandatory guidelines, we should still provide implementation advices. And that first, default values are important and should be selected carefully. Second, uh, give some uh, current known heuristics from some browsers and give out numbers and this echo cancellation is true. Uh, as examples of what, what is done today, which does not mean that somebody in the future, we can revise it and it's not mandatory to follow. So user agents can still change it whenever they want. Uh, so that's the main proposal. I also think that we could discuss tightening the settings selection algorithm, which is really loose in terms of how you would apply the default values in the to unbreak fitness distance ties. But that's not uh, the main thing there. Thoughts? I like this, but I think uh, Johnny Murray or someone else might have uh, other opinions. Uh, the yes, uh, I have some start, Yeah, yeah. Can you, like, you first. Uh, you can go first, Arnold. Yeah. Uh, the problem we started out with uh, was really uh, if you if you take an application and a browser and 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 defaults are sensible now, and then project uh, forward three years, which of the browsers browser and the application will have been updated? And will the sense the same defaults make sense then? Which so what what happens when we embed uh, defaults in the in the spec is that we freeze the defaults in time and make them very very difficult to change. So the for instance the 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 ITU video conferencing stack defaults to 160 by 100 because that was a sensible default at the time. But uh, isn't the concern with uh, revising revising values as breaking backwards compatibility rather than, I mean, because the, the document can be updated. Yeah, the document can be updated, but then, then it renders all previously conformant uh, browsers no. uh, non conformant. That would be non mandatory, that would be non -mandatory uh, guidelines. So it's mm. it's not like you must use 640 by 480 by 30 fits. It's currently, as, as, as of the latest information we have, user agents tend to do that. So please be aware of that mm. and make good choices when you select default values. That's all. Yeah. We would say we would not yeah. add normative text for uh, properties without OS defaults. I think Ewan makes a good point, and he's done good research here that these are actually uh, defaults that seem to be in effect. In particular, I happen to know echo cancellation, for instance, if you turn it true or false, the other ones, uh, noise cancellation and auto game control, follow because the browser is trying to guess, oh, this person cares about this is a WebRTC call versus this is uh, they want natural music. And, uh, but I do want to clarify a couple of things, though. The spec is actually very specific. It says that when there's uh, when their uh, fitness distance is equal, it is entirely up to the user agent. I mean, there's there can be no doubt in the spec that it says that. And I think it even recommends that user agents. I mean, specs can't don't normally mandate what user agents do, but they also recommend to follow system defaults when that when that is. Uh, available. Okay. Uh, so a stereo microphone is a good example. I get a new, I buy a new microphone, and I use it in the call. I would expect stereo. 
At the same time, we get complaints from people who uh, on you know, with 4K displays that just they do get display media and PC ad track and be done with it. And then they complain, well, why is my machine so slow? So there's a conflict between um, the camera microphone is not just for peer connection. At the same time, peer connection is the primary uh, sync of it. So we've been the browsers have been stuck between uh, users often want the most for non peer connection. You probably want the highest best quality for any property. At the same time, we don't want peer connection to break or buckle over. So it's become the the reason for 644, 30 and echo cancellation are all to satisfy the primary sync and to make provide good defaults for that use case. Yeah. So, uh, so I I think it might be useful to have non normative notes for implementation advice. I like that idea, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. go further than that because I, I share Harold's concern that uh, we want to uh, be flexible on defaults between even between browsers and in the future. So would this be an implementation note or uh, should text? I think that for OS defaults, the idea would be that it would be a should. And uh, for implementation advice, <clears throat> like properties without OS defaults, it would be an implementation note. And there would be no should, maybe a may, but not a should. Okay. What that about doing a like, best um, practice? I, I like practice. the idea of uh, OS defaults, I think, for those uh, things where that is well defined and discoverable. Hmm. Although, uh, if you sure. if you go with OS default on Microsoft, uh, it turns out that you get a bunch of uh, signal processing things, some of which have actually been landed by the OEM. And uh, it, it is a real hassle to, to get them all turned off sometimes. Uh, and then when we say OS default, do, do we mean there would be a list of constraints for which it would be recommended to use OS defaults? Or we would say whenever there is an OS default for a constraint uh, listed in this spec, use it? What the um, I, I think I cannot. I do not think we can constrain the OSs. So there would be not a, a mandatory list, but we can mention some properties that we know usually have OS defaults, like sample rate and sample size. So, but again, the, the, the list of these properties would not be mandatory. It's, it would just be yeah. explanatory. So if you- Yeah, I think that would have to be because a user agent is the ultimate interpreter of its OS uh, and what it wants to expose to the web. So if you happen to think, run on, a, on an OS that has chosen 120 for default, it would just happen. Yeah, that's okay. I think we need to throw in mobile because the default behavior on mobile is typically quite different from what it is on desktop. In fact, I don't think I've seen a an Android device that gives me 640 by 480 by 30. Well, but it, it probably gives something yeah. close oh. to it. Yeah. On doc documenting the Rotated. defaults, um, one one possibility instead of documenting it in the spec might be to document it like in MDN browser compat data, have the defaults known value across browsers, which would give this flexibility on mobile and non-mobile, uh, and surface it as well to developers so they know what they get if they don't pick the constrain themselves. Well, that's perhaps outside our purview, but, uh, and also if we might even put a, a year on it too, like in 2021, <laughs> these were the defaults, maybe. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, start the PR then, and uh, we can we can follow the discussion there. Uh, there are all the slides and there are, there are 10 minutes for 10 slides, so I should be <laughs> quick. <laughs> Okay, uh, issue 64, transfer data channel. We talked about it uh, in the past. So there's a slide to say, yeah, it would be nice to uh, transfer data channels. Uh, I've done the experiment. It's uh, live in Safari, will be uh, reasonably soon in Safari Tech Preview. It's working in process, it's working out of process. So you can, you can uh, send a data channel to a worker, you can send a data channel to a service worker. Uh, it's not blocked on main thread, it's great. Maybe uh, it's not highly tested yet, so we need to 
still do work, but it's working. Next slide. Um, so to make the implementation uh, simple, uh, I implemented some rules that allows you or not to transfer a data channel. And basically, you can transfer the data channel as soon as it is created, not after. That's how Safari is working. And you cannot transfer a data channel if there is uh, data that is buffered for, for being written. Because if you transfer it, then it's complex to still try to write things. So it still allows you to you create a data channel, you get the data channel, and as soon as you have it, you transfer it to a worker, it should work. The same thing should happen for on data channel event handler. You, you set local distribution, you do the negotiation, you have an on data channel event handler, and bang, you can send it to a worker, it, it will work. That's what the Safari prototype is doing. In on the GitHub issue, there are a few alternatives that were mentioned. Um, you can relax the rules and say you just run for the data channel if the preferred write is happening. And maybe you will lose some events, like you will, you might miss some messages, you might miss some state updates, but that's part of the idea. We relax the rule and you lose some the nice properties of uh, the, the non-flexible rules. So I think we should go ahead and uh, make a proposal. So write a PR, probably in WebRTC extensions, and choose between the two alternatives. I would try to stick with something that is a bit more rigid, but ensures that all events are delivered properly. Thoughts? For, uh, for reliable data channels, it would be a serious breach of contract if we lost messages out of, out of the middle. That would, that would basically say, uh, please don't. I like the idea of uh, allowing data tra transfer uh, transfer at the moment of of creation that is that, that you have to queue that, that that the task has to be queued uh, that, that the, the flag has to be flipped saying i want to transfer this before you do a, do a send or, send or a receive event yeah sounds good i think this sounds good as well uh the only thing, if we're worried about on data channel and timing, I, we could I, perhaps limit this only to negotiated data channels. Yeah, no, um, pre-negotiated pre data channels are a different matter because then you don't get uh, on data channel handler. Right, right, but then you you uh, you create the JavaScript objects earlier, and they can be transferred earlier. So if we wanted to, I'm just mentioning it, if we wanted to start with the most limited. It sounds um, like Safari already so, uh, goes further, so that's that's good too. Uh, well, it, the number of tests that I wrote is uh, is not enough to uh, cover all edge cases. So currently, it's both are supported, but maybe we'll discover that there are some limitations and we, sh we need to restrict. But so far, it seems that we should be able to support both. So I have a usage for that. Once you've got it in preview, I'm happy to spend some time exercising it, giving it something to do. Um, uh, do. Do we resolve the issue about whether you can see the um, label of an incoming channel? Like if somebody creates a channel, the far end creates you a channel, and you would like, in receiving it, you'd like to pass it off to a worker. Can you do that? Well, you could create data channel on the other side, and then you're good. Mm -hmm. But but when you get it, can you know what the label is, and then base your decision as to whether to pass it to a worker or keep it yourself on that label? Only if you only if it's not uh, pre-negotiated. Okay, I'll try to find out. Carried in the open message. I guess the question is, does the open message count as a write? Mm. 
uh, the on data channel event handler doesn't happen if you don't get an uh, on data uh, an open data message. So okay, so cool. No. Yeah, you you can change the right at uh, buffer the amount equals zero. If buffer the amount equals zero, then you should be good to transfer it. If it's in the same uh, even loop that you created the data channel. Uh, that sounds like an invitation to being flaky. Um, so, uh, so I, I would prefer to do to do. Uh, well, if you if, if you, uh, I mean, if you create data channels that are already opened, then you can send synchronously as well. And in that case, we do not want to transfer if you sent already. So that's one thing we need to correct. And. Yeah. So the idea is really when, when you start sending, uh, you should don't you shouldn't be able to transfer basically. Okay, uh, it seems there consensus, so I'll try to start writing a PR, and I have three minutes for six slides, so we're on track. <laughs> it started. Well, the, last, track. the last slide was the one I liked, liked least, so you can drop that. <laughs> uh, yeah, the last one. Uh, I, I was hoping to write more slides, but I didn't have time. So that's why the last one is uh, already a summary. But uh, I will try to write more slides. Anyway, uh, transfer media stream track. Why do it? Uh, Elad had, had the issue, uh, the use case where maybe the iframe wants to get the viewport and send it to uh, slide to meetgoogle.com, and meetgoogle.com will do the networking. Uh, there's also the possibility that maybe if you can transfer media stream track to a worker, you can do media stream track to web connect to a PC data channel, all of that in a worker, which uh, would be very handy. Uh, next slide. So can we do it? Can, can we even do it cross process? Because there we are not talking about data channel, uh, we are talking about like large amount of data, especially video. Uh, the thing I would first like to say is that media stream, stream track is already flowing out of process in all over the place. Uh, content is very, very often produced out of, con uh, out of process. It is very often processed or consumed out of process as well. So the browsers already do this very efficiently. They do cross-process things very efficiently and it's working. So what we are talking about there with uh, this notion of transfer is that we might actually uh, trigger additional hops, which might have some impact, but it's not as big as what we think it could be. And this is only for out of process. For in process transfer, meaning you transfer from a window to a dedicated worker, am I, uh, I, I'm pretty sure the impact would be zero. Like if instead of queuing a task to a window, you queue a task to a worker, that's just, that's it. So it should be, it should really be free and easy to implement. Next slide. Yeah, so how can it be done? Uh, it could be done very similarly to RTC data channel. You define the transfer algorithm, you define a neutered behavior. So maybe uh, it, when you transfer a media stream track, the track will get ended. And clearly, the lifetime of a transfer media stream track needs to be tied to creation context. So if you call get user media in one place, you transfer the track elsewhere, the track will get ended as soon as the creation context is gone. That's really something we need to, to make sure. And it's similar to data channel because data channel is tied to a peer connection that will go away if its creation context goes away. Um, so it seems feasible. Next slide. Um, there are some alternatives. We could use media capture transform as a shim. Uh, but it, it has potential downsides. It's more difficult to optimize this code path. Uh, you do not have the same support as transferable streams out of box. For instance, you don't have the muted events, uh, the ended events, the get settings, the apply constraints, all of those things that are that make things that makes life really easy, really easy and nice. So you could still do it by using post message back and forth, but. Uh, it would be a lot of work for web developers to do it. And my intuition tell me that we should try to work on transferring beta stream track support. So thoughts? 
Yeah, I think this has uh, legs. I think uh, with the time allowed, uh, I do have some thoughts, but I don't know if there's enough time to. But I think uh, it's worth uh, looking at this direction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's some unique uh, questions, like if you do a track clone, for example, uh, how that would be treated for some sources. And we might have to make it a per source decision for things like camera. Uh, a track clone is, is uh, already independent. It can be cross-processed for other tabs. But for other sources like uh, Canvas, for example, there might be uh, two. Uh, you might have concurrent reads on data if we're not careful. Yep, that's but, a good point. Yeah, I think... uh, I'm pretty sure that in many cases, people will want to actually clone tracks and uh, transfer one clone track. So we should definitely um, do that. and it's specific to tracks it's not in data channels so that's a really good point that we need right. to investigate and the other question would be lifetime uh would lifetime end when the original document ends yep yeah that's that's part of it's like data channel we, we need to do that uh otherwise okay. it would be a nightmare in terms of security privacy and implementation right transfer to a service worker that never ends no. <laughs> yep Uh, would there be any restrictions on transferring across cross our region? Um, no, you can already do that by taking your media stream track to web audio, get the bytes, and send them from post message to another origin. You can do the same with Canvas, uh, media stream track to video elements to Canvas, and then send RGB data over to cross origin. So my guess is that uh, we should not put uh, constraints there. Maybe we should probably get security review on that just to be sure. Okay, I'll check. That's good. I think that uh, one use case that Elan mentioned was that there would be an iframe uh, from sitesgoogle.com, and they will try. It, they will want to transfer it to another iframe being uh, meetgoogle.com, which is cross origin that same uh, like um, but uh, same, same site yeah yeah same site yeah oh yeah sites are overrated is it is it something that you're interested in and you, you might want to implement if there's a spec for it It's something that uh, I, I would find useful in certain contexts, especially when they, if you have the ability to, tra to transfer window to window. I think it's useful more for figuring out how to do all these APIs and answer all these questions that Bernard mentioned earlier than for actual use cases right now. Yeah, one sense? thing. Oh, Guido, you want to talk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, well, uh, I just want to say that we, we have heard uh, requests for this sometimes from, from developers. OK. So so there, there, there is some demand for this. Mm. OK. Uh, good. So now the ne next step would be to, to try it out. I guess. Uh, there's one more slide, but it's already uh, five minutes late. So I'm guessing that I will try to expand my last slide for the next meeting. Yeah, let's let's do that. So I have another month to come to come up with con counter arguments. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should prepare the slides in advance so that you. you can, uh, <laughs> Uh, this, was, this was a slide I didn't like. <laughs> so let's let's hope. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you all for coming. We'll have fun. We'll have fun, uh, more fun in a month or so. And uh, happy bye Easter bye. for everyone who does that. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye. Stop recording.